Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for how it enters into our lives to comfort, but also to counsel, to take what we think we know and to show us what is true, to show us your love and your mercy and your grace and to have it enter in at the right times. We pray, O God, that as we read your word, may it read our hearts. May our eyes be open to what you have to say this morning. Amen. From Genesis 4, starting at verse 1, I'll be reading from the NRSV. So if you have your pew Bibles, those are NLT. That'll count for the difference in what you're looking at. Now the man knew his wife Eve, And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil and I shall be hidden from your face and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The Bible can be really hard on firstborns. but generous to the seconds. Uh, Of course, we read early in the passage of Scripture this part, and it's not that God has anything against the firstborns, but it's that God actually looks into the power systems that are created even from that system of power distribution and says, I speak a better word. It's not that God has anything against them, but God inverts it. God's ways are not our own. Our passage this morning is very thick. Today can't possibly tell the whole story. Each word is packed with meaning and innuendo. But what I hope to do this morning is paint a clear picture. Here's the simple story. The simple story is Cain, whose name means acquire or get. You notice Eve said, I've produced a man, I've acquired a man, I've made a man with the help of the Lord. His name means acquire or get. He he offers his gift, his worship to God. God responds differently than wanted or expected. Cain doesn't get what he hoped for. The text actually isn't really clear why, although folks have talked about this for ages and ages. You may have heard some sermons preach as to why Cain's was not accepted over Abel's. But what we're sure of is that God doesn't really offer many answers in his conversation with Cain. See, I don't think the point of this story 
is to apologize to God or, or to over-theologize this thing so that we make an excuse for what God did, his, his choice of Abel. I think the point is to really feel it. You ever feel like God is against you? You ever feel like God kind of dealt you a bad hand or, or, or to change the metaphor, pushed the short straw upon you? Meanwhile, you're at a loss at how that person, that person, that person is getting the blessing. That person is accepted. Yeah, Cain is here. Cain is feeling that. He's confused, he's lost, and his God seems to be making the problem even worse. Like the story of Job, there are no answers there. But God comes to Cain and says, Cain, why are you so dejected? As if you don't know God. Of course, that's Cain's take. Jealousy for his brother consumes him and he murders his brother Abel. But you see, even in that moment, God continues to be intimate with Cain and present even in his life. God continues to show mercy, always persistent in pursuit of the wayward and the lost. And this is actually what blew my mind when I reread this story. It blew my mind to see how Cain consistently walked away and God, in this moment, consistently came to be with him. It, I always thought Cain was the one, the anti-chosen one, right? Those people that you can think of, those people groups that you think of, the ones that God doesn't want any part of, that God shuns, that God sends away. We have it in our mind, and our common language for it now is people who go to heaven, people who go to hell. It's the person and the people who don't get God's blessing. And yet, after every mistake Cain makes after every emotional downturn and poor decision, God pursues Cain. God comes after Cain. And ultimately, sadly, it's Cain that leaves God's presence and not vice versa. Did you see the inversions that are present in the passage? The weaker is exalted. A love that is not earned. A God who pursues those who turn their back on him. Do you see the flip? This is our God. The, the series we're in is, are, is questions God asks of us. And he, God asks a few questions in this passage like, what have you done? Yes, do you remember when mom and dad asked you, what have you done? Do you, 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 I'm sure you, the, the emotions are bubbling up even at this moment because it was probably something really bad. Like the time you decided to flip your brother off his foot, off your feet, and he rotated in the air and landed on his arm and broke it. Or the time you decided not to tell your parents that you were driving to Reno and your car blew up in Bishop. Or the time you drove recklessly, collided with a van, it rolled two times and landed on its head. All of those times, my parents told me, what have you done? And you may know those times. God comes to Cain in a situation far worse. What have you done, Cain? You've taken life. I gave you the gift to give life to produce life from the ground, and now you've put in the ground death. What have you done? What did Cain do? He took what only belonged to God, life. The acquirer was bent on taking, taking what's for me, what do I get out of this? Where is your brother, Cain? Where is your brother? See, I believe that Genesis 4 puts a mirror up to us so that we see ourselves. It's, it's, it's that we've all known jealousy. We've all used our relationship with God as an excuse to hurt others. We've even walked away from God's presence. It's something 
that theologian Helmut Tilaka called the Cain within us. This is not just Cain's story. We adopt it anytime we let sin master us. And what does sin master in Cain? What is sin's first sacrifice that it desires? Another person. Sin masters Cain to murder Abel. Sin sets us against each other. It seeks to take life. It seeks to take our life to take others. Sin seeks to master you, Cain. You must master it. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, Cain, yes, you are. You are, don't you see it? God has made us for relationship with him and with his creations. You are your brother's keeper. This is a truth you had better keep as firmly as you keep your brother. And this is the flip that God hammers home in this passage this is not about me and God and pushing everyone else away to get closer to God. This is not about me getting comfy and cozy with God at the exclusion of those around me. Because that would seem logical, that would seem rational. Remove the distractions, remove the things around me so I can go to my goal, which is heavenward. And God says, no. Do you want to know how to know me? Look around you. I'm serious, look around you. This, this is life. This is life. God's gift, God's message, God's hope is that you would know you are your brother's keeper. So how does Cain respond to that good news, that good news of knowing that he is called not only to receive the life God gave him, but to give it to the others around here? How does Cain respond? How do I respond? I mean, how do I respond in moments like that? Well, my wife only knows. I tend to sing what I remember from my childhood, Nobody likes me, everybody hates me, guess I better eat worms, right? Something like that, you know the song. It's hard to fathom. It's like, no, God, you gotta like me. And if you like this person, you can't like me. I'm going through that with my kids right now, by the way. And I see it all the time. It's that notion that it's, it, and it's hard to escape, that there is this relationship between God, myself, and others. This triangle even that God has set up that calls us and beckons us heavenward. I mean, it's, it's like Winnie the Pooh, it's like Eeyore. Thanks for noticing me, God. It's that place where we can get and get stuck. I'm constantly unsure of that triangle of where I stand. So what do we do? Where's the hope? Where's the way forward when we see our brother or sister, ones that may have been blessed over us? Or ones that we just can't stand, the, the uh, farmers to our shepherd, or vice versa, the ones that we are set against, our brothers and our sisters. What do we do when the cane within us lurks at our door? Helmut Tilaka offers what he sees is not only one thing to do, it is the only thing to do. He writes, envy can only be combated by letting God give me a new faith. A faith that accepts the other person just as he has been sent to me by a higher hand. As someone who has his place and function in God's plan exactly as I have. As someone who confronts me with the command of love and in whom God's higher thoughts come to meet me. Love of God, love of others. We are our brother's keeper. 
How would this change your life if you saw the people, the people at work, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your family, the people soon to be at school as the people you were called to keep? What would change if you saw these people through those new eyes of faith? If you saw them as gifts from the hand of God above. Maybe the acceptance that God seeks is not the acceptance that we seek. It's the acceptance of the, of the ones who God has put in our life from a higher hand. And maybe this is more important than if you thought you got a fair shake in life. Maybe the fair shake you didn't really get is the grand stage of life opening to you. Maybe it's those moments that even matter most when you are set against your brother, your sister. Maybe it's how you respond in those moments that speak the deepest word. Maybe it's the people that are looking to you to respond in the right way that mean the most. Maybe it's the creator of the universe that was put to death in a criminal's place. That's anything but a fair shake in life. Maybe those people who have it all, you know those people that don't even exist, that we think about? Maybe those people are not even given the opportunity that we have to show a deeper kind of love, a self-sacrificial one. So who are those people for you? Who is that person that is the farmer to your shepherd? Who is that person that's the golden child while you're slumming around? Who is it that needs to be loved so freely, so truly, so exemplar of God's love on the cross? And this is the flip that screams the gospel, the good news. Hebrews 12 says this, Abel's blood speaks, but Jesus' blood speaks a better word. Abel's blood speaks condemnation. Jesus' blood speaks salvation, forgiveness, peace. And it brings us right back to the story we heard from the Robinsons, the story of one who offers a deeper kind of justice, a more heavenward type of revenge, forgiveness, reconciliation, peace. Who are the people in this room, the people you are looking around at now that are in need of that same word, that better word that Jesus' love and blood speaks from the ground? Who are the people in this church in your small group, the people that you would naturally be set against. The world is watching and waiting and oftentimes doesn't like the kind of justice that this speaks of, the radical love of accepting those around you as from the hand of God. But this is our challenge this morning. You are your brother's your sister's keeper. We are. Are you willing to speak that better word to them today and in the coming days? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the love that you have given us because it is from your love it is from your great grace on the cross. It is from your initial reaching out to us, pursuit of us, that we see what love truly is. We pray, oh God, that living in that, that living in that fresh air and abundance of life that you offer, may we also freely offer the gift of life to others. May our hearts be so transformed they are not set on taking, taking, taking life, but on receiving from you and giving out of the abundance that we've been given. Help us, O oh Lord. Give us strength. 
Give us peace. In your name we pray. Amen.